Hello and welcome back. Today I want to continue working on my new linear regulator and today hopefully is the today when I actually finish it. At least the first version. I already have a few upgrade ideas. So if you're curious, then keep watching. Last time I talked about the various ideas that ended up being implemented into the design and how the general concept should end up looking. Now before moving forward, I want to share a few of the ideas that did not make it into the design for whatever reason. Now these are not necessarily bad ideas, you might find them useful for your particular design, but these were not something right for my particular circuit. So on the topic of efficiency, the big problem with a linear regulator is that the input current is equal or larger than the output current. This means that the power dissipation on the regulator will be dependent on the output voltage. When the output is at a minimum, the power dissipation is maximum and the efficiency is minimum. Now there are a few things that can be done about this. One way is to use a transformer with multiple windings and based on the required output, switch in between the various tabs. The input voltage only needs to be a few volts higher than the output voltage, so based on the required output voltage, a different winding can be used. Now there are multiple ways to implement such a feature. The selection can be done manually by the user using something like a range selection switch, or it can be done automatically by relays and comparators, which can switch based on the voltage present on the output. The transformer that I'm using in my supply is 2 times 12 volts and I seriously considered using it in either a high current 12 volt mode or a low current 24 volt mode. So you could achieve this by using a double switch. There was just one small problem with that. Other than the front panel space, there would be no room for this switch, the regulator that I'm using is rated for 40 volts. Now considering that I'm using the 5 volt negative offset, that means I can only supply the circuit with a maximum of 35 volts. But 24 volts AC, when rectified, turns into 33.9. Add in a bit of tolerance from the mains and any other transients that might occur, and you end up being very close to destroying the regulator. Since I only have a single IC, I decided not to risk it and keep a single 12 volt AC input that should provide about 17 volts of DC output. The other approach used in most modern day supplies can be observed in this linear technology datasheet. So this implies the use of a high efficiency switching tracking pre-regulator followed by a low noise linear regulator. The idea here is that the switching regulator will always provide a few volts more than the final output and the exact value is linked to the user defined value. So the user only needs to set the output voltage of the linear regulator and then the tracking regulator will track the output of the linear regulator and adjust its voltage automatically. So no complex adjustments are needed. Now since you did put a switching regulator into the mix, this can make things quite noisy. But if you can properly filter it, this is the most efficient way to create a low noise power supply. Now one of the things I did not like about the old supply was that the supply cables were permanently connected. Now this was quite common back when this thing was made, but it's quite inconvenient. So to fix that, I decided to use one of these generic power plug adapters. But the problem that this brought was that when you fit it onto the rear side of the case, the heatsink doesn't really fit anymore. So this was the old hole into which the heatsink was screwed into. And well, if you line it up, you can clearly see that the heatsink is touching the power connector. So for that reason, the heatsink had to lose one of its elements. And like this, with some new holes drilled, everything fits nicely on the back side. Another thing that's worth mentioning is that the main board that I prepared has the bottom side traces exposed. So these are conductive and you don't really want these to get into contact with the metallic frame. So that would just cause some short circuits. Now normally what you would do is put this board onto some spacers. So something to keep it away from the bottom side of the box. But because of the limited height restriction, this won't really do. 
So what I ended up doing was to add this plastic here so that even if the board touches it, it will not short circuit. Last thing to mention is this bracket that I prepared to fix the power transformer onto the frame. Now initially this frame was designed with these four fixing holes for the transformer. But the toroid that I'm using only has a single fixation screw. So to combine the two, I prepared this adapter to which the transformer is fixed in a single point and then this gets fixed in four points onto the old frame. So time to start building and it's good to start with the least accessible bits. In this case, that will be the front panel. Since this is filled with quite a lot of components and a bunch of wires and everything needs to be kept as compact as possible to make room for the rest of the device. So if we start putting things together. Now on the subject on the front panel, first of all, I remembered I can't really put in the upper components before I put in the lower components. But anyway, on the output connectors, I added a reverse protection diode. So in case a reverse voltage is connected to the output, this will protect the rest of the circuit. And I also added a set of capacitors from the two lines to the frame. So this should help with reducing the noise. Now, other than the output bananas, I also added in an LED so that I know when the output is on. So this switch doesn't just connect the output on, it will also turn on the LED. And with the potentiometer cap added, the front panel is more or less done. So most of the connections are already made and we just need various wires that will connect this part to the rest of the design. Next, we can start to work on the rear side. So we need to build this before putting in the transformer because that will make the rear part inaccessible. And there we have it. So now we can insert the transformer. And well, the final thing is to add in the main board, make all of the interconnections and see if everything actually works. Now, I will be honest. I already built the supply a while back and it worked. Then I decided to make a video about how I built it. So I had to take it apart again. And this process did take its toll. Some of the bits were irrecoverably damaged like the main regulator board. But because I took it apart and reassembled it, I was able to make some improvements. So first off, the wiring looks a lot nicer. It's far more compact. It used to be quite a mess before. And finally, I wanted to add some active discharge. So I find it very annoying with a linear regulator when using the voltage setting, you want to go from a high voltage to a low voltage, but the output capacitor stays charged, thus requiring some time for the output voltage to stabilize to the desired value. But the way around this is to turn the output stage into a push-pull arrangement that can forcefully discharge the output capacitor if a low voltage is set. This can be done if you have access to the base of the output transistor, which in the case of the LM723 can be done using the compensation pin. So adding this active discharge is one difference in my regulator board that I have compared to the old design. Now, in the interest of safety, I put on the rear cover, so tightly screwed it in, just so none of the high voltage parts are exposed. And while well, it's ready to start. So, moment of truth, does it work? Well, there's no smoke, so that's a good sign. Well, nothing seems to be wrong. But that doesn't mean that the power supply is actually working correctly. So next step is to start looking into the behaviors of the power supply in more details, just to see if everything is okay, and if needed, to make various adjustments. So let's take things one at a time. First thing to look at is the output voltage range. Does the power supply actually go down to zero volts? For that, I didn't connect any sort of load other than a voltmeter. 
So this will also show us just how accurate the built-in meter thing is. So if we turn on the output, so we can see that it's off because the LED is off, we can see that the two displays are more or less the same. A bit of tolerance is perfectly normal. But now if we play around with the potentiometer and we start going down to lower voltages, we can see that indeed it does go down to zero volts, maybe even a bit lower. But even after you went there, there is a certain range in the potentiometer where nothing really happens. So this will need a bit of fixing. It's not very difficult, you just need to add an extra resistor on this end of the potentiometer to reduce its range, but it's something that needs to be done. If we now go to the other end of the scale, so to see the maximum voltage that we can output, we can see that we are going up to about 17.1 volts. Now the achievable voltage could probably be higher if we use a active rectifying bridge. Right now I'm using the standard PN diode bridge and the voltage at the input of the supply is this voltage plus about one or two volts which is dropping on the supply. So even though we're using the 12 volt AC winding, we are getting slightly more than 12 volts times the square root of two. So because of whatever reason, the voltage at the input of the supply is about 80, 19 volts. So if we would have used the 24 volt winding, we would have had double this and coupled with the five volts of the negative offset, we most likely would have destroyed the regulator. So it's very good that we only used a single 12 volt winding. So just keep in mind when using AC transformers that the rectified voltage under no load conditions can be slightly higher than you expect. So just make sure that doesn't ruin your circuit. Next, let's look at the output's behavior under load. For that, I connected my active load through an ammeter. And well, first thing we can notice is that the ammeter accuracy is not that great, but it will do. Maybe it needs a bit of calibration as well. And if we start increasing the current, one of the things you might notice is that the loaded output voltage is slightly different than the unloaded one. So if I now remove the load, which is set to one ampere, right now we're at 6.84 volts. We go to 6.9697 volts. So most likely this is a sensing issue. The power supply is sensing the output voltage on the power supply board. It's not really sensing the output voltage at the connector. So this is a place where remote sensing might be helpful to improve the output static accuracy. Now, another thing to look for is how does adding a load affect the maximum output voltage? So under no load conditions, we can supply about 17.2 volts. If we start adding a load, we can already see that the output voltage is affected. And well, if we go up to one ampere, instead of 17 volts, we're only getting about 13.6. Now, to an extent, having the output voltage lower under high current conditions is normal. More voltage will drop on the rectifying bridge. The transformer's output will be slightly lower because of its internal resistance. Or maybe there's some sort of problem with the driving of the power transistor. So that again is something that might need fixing in the future. Now, after doing a bit of digging, the problem turned out not to have anything to do with the regulator circuit, but rather the transformer output just varies a lot under load. It's quite a large variation and there's not much that can be done about it. At the same time, another thing that needs adjusting is the output range of the potentiometer. So there's no point in being able to set a voltage higher than what the power supply is actually capable of supplying. So after any other adjustment is done, the output voltage range should be limited so that you cannot set an output voltage that cannot be ensured by the power supply under loaded conditions. Now, one way to see if there's any sort of hidden issue with a circuit is to let it run for a while and observe how it behaves. So for that, I set up the power supply to run into the active load, supplying one ampere at 10 volts. And it's been running like this for about 20 minutes and nothing bad happened yet. And the first thing to observe is just how stable the supply is. 
So when I first turned it on, the output voltage was 10.07, 10.08. Now it's up to 10.12. That's about a 50 millivolt voltage difference. It's not a lot, so that's acceptable. And the next thing to look at is what are the various hotspots in the circuit. So for this, a thermal camera is useful. So if we first of all look at a general overview of the circuit, we'll see three main things heating up. On the one side, the power transistor, which is perfectly normal, so it's supposed to heat up. And then in the circuit part of the device, well, the transformer itself is relatively cold, so that's a good thing. But then we have a few really, really hot points. So one of them is the rectifying bridge, which is showing about 100 degrees, which is a bit much. Now this rectifying bridge is built with the regular PN type of diodes, and the 100 degrees measured isn't the most accurate measurement since no special treatment was applied to the components. But regardless, the components are quite hot. And we're only drawing one ampere. So most likely I will be changing out the rectifying bridge to something a bit more efficient that does not heat up so much. Now, the other hot spot is on the power supply board itself. And here we see a couple of resistors heating up. They're not that hot, but they're still a hot spot. And these particular resistors are the current sensing components. So all of the output current is running through these resistors so that the regulator can sense the current going through them. Now, not much can be done about these, maybe other than using a larger case size and expanding the copper areas. But all in all, the supply seems to be working nicely and it's stable. Finally, it's time to look at the output noise of the power supply. For that, I connected the output terminals to the oscilloscope using a probe, and I set the oscilloscope into AC coupling with 20 MHz bandwidth limit. I use this because if we don't use this limit, then we're just picking up a lot of environmental noise. So for this test, I will be leaving the 20 MHz bandwidth limit. Now, because of the way in which the output connectors are placed, you can't really use a low noise connection. So that's why I'm using the alligator clip and the output of the probe is directly connected to the bananas. So to start things off, we can see that with the power supply off, it's connected to the mains, and we're getting about 30 millivolts of peak-to-peak -peak noise. So this is the noise from the environment, not necessarily from the power supply. If we now turn on the power supply, it's set to about 9.5 volts, we can see that the output noise stays roughly the same. So whether the supply is on or not, the noise is more or less the same. Finally, we can connect an output load, so the active load is set to about half an ampere, and this time we do start to see something. So even though our peak-to-peak -peak noise is still in the same range, about 25 millivolts, we can clearly make out that there's a bit of an oscillation in there. So right now my cursors are set so that they are showing a frequency of 100 hertz. So these things are happening every 200 hertz. So it's probably related to the rectification action of the rectifier bridge. Most likely, this can be reduced if you're using a proper ground plane. So not the test board that I have in the design. But anyway, regardless, the noise of the supply is quite reduced. So much lower than my previous supply. So I will consider this acceptable. In the end, even if it's not the best power supply, it works. It did mostly fulfill the initial requirements, low noise, zero volts output capability, and the use of some old components. It's usable, but it still needs some tweaking here and there. But that's half the fun of it anyway. And with that said, hope you got some useful information after this. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to be up to date with all my videos. And see you next time. Bye bye.